power starts to run out of fuel, and both balances begin to break down, and the star leaves the main sequence. Here's a more detailed view of the conditions and timings of the evolution of a one solar mass star, such as the Sun. These numbers come from computer models of the various well-known physics relations pertaining to stars. We can look at the first column, and we see that the main sequence lifetime is easily well over 100 times longer than the post-main sequence phases, particularly when the red giant and subgiant stages are taken together. Since we're looking at the transition between the main sequence and the final state, meaning a white dwarf that eventually cools off to a black dwarf, we see that this shorter epoch will fill the sun with change. Even though the surface temperature doesn't vary a huge amount during the change, that's not the whole story. We see that the core density steadily rises as the fusion products are compressed in the core. The size of the sun will also radically change. When it first becomes a red giant, it'll swell to the size of Venus orbit, and during the asymptotic giant branch phase, it will exceed the Earth's orbit. The glowing planetary nebula itself will expand to nearly a light year, with the central part of the nebula going to Jupiter's orbit it will end its life as a core about the size of the Earth. As we see from the Stefan Boltzmann law for stars below, small changes in the surface temperature will lead to big changes in the luminosity. But a real change for the Sun's future luminosity will be the radius change, when, for that short period at the AGB peak, the Sun will be one of the brightest stars within a couple thousand light years, illuminating distant worlds the way red giants Betelgeuse, Antares, and Arcturus do for our night sky. So how do we determine how the sun evolves? Researchers using computer code create models using the equations of stellar structure that I showed you in my previous lectures on the interior of the sun. Plug all this into large computers and let it cook for a few hours or days. These large simulations take as inputs the surface parameters of the sun, such as known mass, observed luminosity, surface composition, and radius, and munge them up to show how things will change as a function of mass fraction inside the sun. Combining this with the methods of energy transport, such as radiative and convective transport, shows how the sun retains and loses its energy to space. These simulations then check what happens as fuel is used up in the core. The model is usually run for time slices on the mass fractions. First, you have to solve the entire sun for given conditions from surface to core and core to surface, then advance each slice in time, specifically the core, to see how the interior conditions change with time. The models take so long to run because one needs to vary the steps in time and radial mass fraction. This dynamic grid modeling is quite computationally intensive. Luckily, today, unlike back when I was in grad school, you can spin up a bunch of nodes on AWS and run it together if you're on a skimpy university budget. Then, this all takes a huge wad of numbers, which are the map of the inside of the star, and it shows you how it changes with time. Below are some papers you can look up if you want to go take a peek at some of the published models of the evolution of the sun. Let's watch the sun evolve as determined by these huge simulations. Included in these simulations are observational matchups, meaning that there is something in the sky today that hasn't been observed with the characteristics of the sun that we'll be discussing. I'll be describing one such model to a great extent. Five billion years ago, the Sun formed from a dense molecular cloud, such as Barnard 68, or other such dark clouds that we've seen, the Bach globules. It took about 50 million years to form from this stellar cocoon, finally reaching the main sequence at about 4.5 billion years ago. This is the ZAMS, or Zero Age Main Sequence, when the Sun first alit onto the main sequence and started burning hydrogen in its core. At this time, it was very different than we see today. It was a little fainter at about 70% of a solar luminosity. It was a little smaller at roughly 9 tenths of a solar radius and a little cooler at 5580 Kelvin rather than 5800 Kelvin. At this point, the zero age main sequence, when hydrogen initiation occurred, the Sun came to thermal and hydrostatic equilibrium. What we'll show is a sketch of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and on this we'll plot a track, called a Hayashi track, that shows how the Sun's temperature and luminosity changes with time. The Sun is currently a middle-aged, low-mass star on the main sequence. Its age is well known by meteorites to be 4.567 billion years, or 4.5 times 10 to the 9th years. Its mass today is our standard unit of mass, the solar mass, which is about 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. 
We also use the solar radius as a standard unit of measurement. Its radius is about 700,000 kilometers, or 100 Earth radii. That means end-to-end -end 100 Earths could fit across the Sun. Makes you think about the sizes of sunspots, like the ones you're watching in these images from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. The luminosity of the Sun is about 4 times 10 to the 26th watts, which is much more than the human race could generate in a trillion years. This solar luminosity is also a standard unit we'll see over and over again in this lecture series. The surface temperature is 5,800 Kelvin. Half of its core has been fused into helium, so there's an enormously large inert helium core in the center of the Sun today. The Sun at this time is in a state of hydrostatic and thermal equilibrium. The energy that's being lost from the photosphere as light is balanced by energy being produced in the core, and the Sun's not getting larger or smaller in size. This is the way of the Sun for about 10 billion years. During the Sun's main sequence life, the hydrogen burning part of the core fuses hydrogen into helium using the proton proton chain at a temperature of 15 million Kelvin. Surrounding the core is the convective zone, with a buffer of a shallow radiative zone separating them. While the appearance of the Sun by this diagram makes it seem like the mass might be smoothly distributed, half of the mass of the Sun is in the core region. That inert helium core will become important very soon. Even while on the main sequence, the composition of the star's core is changing. Eventually, as hydrogen in the core is consumed, the star begins to leave the main sequence. Its evolution from then on depends very much on the mass of the star. The diagram shows the percentage of, of hydrogen in orange and helium in blue. We see the percent going from bottom to top, 0 to 100, and the radius increasing to the right, with the core on the left and the photosphere on the right. The top panel shows the composition at the ZAMS, the zero-age main sequence. The Sun's original composition was inherited from the interstellar medium from which it formed. From the studies of the local interstellar medium, originally it would have had about 71% hydrogen, about 27% helium by mass. The remaining 2% was other elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, and iron. But by number, it started off as about 92% hydrogen, about 8% helium, with all the other elements contributing less than a tenth of a percent of the remaining nuclei. The middle panel shows the distribution today. The composition of the photosphere at the right side of the diagram by mass is 74.9% and helium is 23.8%, which means that some of the helium has settled down into the core due to gravity since the sun's birth. We can see that the blue slab of helium in the core has increased from its original 24% to now about 60% of the mass of the core due to fusion. The core is the only region of the Sun that produces an appreciable amount of thermal energy through fusion. 99% of the Sun's power is generated in that inner 24% of its radius, and almost no fusion occurs beyond 30% of the radius. The convection starts at about 45% of the radius, so the products of the core do not show up in the photosphere during the main sequence life. The bottom panel shows the state of the Sun's composition after 10 billion years the core will have expanded and the hydrogen will be gone from the core. The blue fraction of helium that has moved away from the central 30% shows something's happened to the location where fusion occurs. It's moved closer to the surface. At this point, the sun will evolve quickly.